I don't know if you um, remember the title of this session, but there was uh, something about rare diseases. That's what we did this morning. And then there was a critique, so to speak, of reductionism. And uh, Michael Joyner, our, our next speaker, is uh, that critic. Uh, Michael is a physiologist and uh, anesthesiologist at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, but he's also sort of, at least in the perspective of this meeting, the, the anti-Larry Gold. Questions whether or not uh, precision medicine is really going to, to do everything that we're hoping it would do. And uh, he had a, uh, an op-ed piece in the, in the New York Times uh, in January, and which he said, and I'll just quote out of context because that's my favorite way to quote people, uh, uh, said, uh, precision medicine is unlikely to make most of us healthier. Uh, he, he's also said, look, just tell them that uh, I'm a forceful proponent of holism in a reductionist world. Uh, uh, but he's a hero because on his NIH bio sketch, the number one item that he lists under positions and honors, Tucson City Lifeguard. All right? So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How many guys do you know who do that? All right, so it's a pleasure to have Michael here. Michael Joyner. Thank you very much, Alan. And when I heard Larry give the introduction uh, yesterday, it occurred to me that he might actually be a recovering reductionist. So you've seen this intentionally provocative title, and we'll just start with a few definitions. For those of you who are not steeped in this uh, sort of lingo, HGP is the Human Genome Project. SNP, or SNP, is a single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a common DNA sequence variation within a population, usually at least 1%. And GWAS is Genome-Wide Association Study. And that just asks the simple question, are the common DNA variants associated with a given trait? Height, weight, heart disease, diabetes, you name it. Now, what about reductionism? This is Sir James Black, who discovered two blockbuster drugs and really is one of the founders of modern pharmacology. And here's what he had to say. Reductionism has proven to be our most successful analytical tool. Molecular biologists have reduced cells into the huge number of molecular components that are the subject of modern biochemistry. So it's good to know that the molecular biologists are actually a subset of biochemistry, just for everybody. <laughs> Organisms, tissues, and cells are certainly composed of these molecular components. However, as they interact with each other, they form a system that, like the psychoanalyst idea of gestalt, is more than the sum of its parts. Components are to systems as words are to poems and pigments are to paintings. The decomposition of poems and paintings into words and pigment, pigment is not reversible. So I'm going to next argue, or at least tell you my perspective, that the Human Genome Project was where targeted research and big science met reductionism. So let's look at some of the ideas underpinning it. The sequence of the human DNA is the reality of our species. Sequencing the human genome is like pursuing the holy grail. And finally, my favorite one from Leroy Hood. We will learn more about human development and pathology in the next 25 years than we have in the past 2000. Now, Dr. Hood said that in 1992, and the good news about this quote is he still has two years until the clock runs out. <laughs> so enthusiasm was still high at the end of the beginning. Here's what Francis Collins says. And that really, one of the great questions in, in kind of modern some media in, in science is whether it's Francis Collins or James Watson makes more outrageous statements. <laughs> if research support continues at vigorous levels, it is hard to imagine that genomic science will not soon reveal the mysteries of the hereditary factors in heart disease, cancer, diabetes, mental illness, and a host of other conditions. He said that in 2001. Now, I would argue it's maybe time to curb our enthusiasm. Now, why? The common disease, common variant hypothesis has been rejected. 
we're still waiting for gene therapy, $4 billion later. The pharma pipeline, a lot of people claim is dry, or at least those are the types of headlines you see in the Wall Street Journal and other scientific uh, uh, publications like Forbes. And there is the reproducibility crisis we've heard about a bit uh, the last few days. Now, fortunately, Dr. Collins is undeterred. He said in 2010 is that my job, it seems to me, is not to spend my time apologizing for being optimistic. So let's think a little bit about targeted research and, and, and really revisit some ideas by the great philosopher Yogi Berra, who said it's like deja vu all over again. All the way with LBJ. This is targeted research in 1966. Here's what Lyndon Johnson said. Presidents need to show more interest in what the specific results of research are in their lifetime a, and in their administration. A great deal of basic research has been done, but I think the time has come to zero in on the targets by trying to get our knowledge fully applied. We must make sure no life-saving discovery is locked up in the laboratory. Who here works in this building? Yeah, I want to know where the, where the life-saving discoveries and I want to know where they're locked up. <laughs> Who's got the key? Larry, the building's named after you, for God's sakes. You ought to know where it is. <laughs> so to show that I'm a bar bipartisan critic, we'll go after Richard Nixon next. The war on cancer. This is when targeted research meets big science. These are deaths per 100,000 population in 1930. About 200 deaths per 100,000 for men, about 170 for women. The war on cancer starts here. Deaths from cancers continue to go up. Then they start to go down. For women, it's remained relatively flat. And we're back to about where we started when Nixon started the war on can uh, cancer. And what did we learn? We learned that tobacco control and screening uh, wins over uh, cell biology and chemotherapy. Almost all of the reduction I've shown you in men is attributable to reductions in cigarette smoking. Almost all of it. A couple of other screening tests. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, people like me in, in the cardiovascular area took a different approach. So let's look at the decline in, in deaths from cardiovascular disease. This is about 450 deaths per 100,000 population. The first open heart procedure in 1954. First beta blocker, which is what Dr. Black discovered. Coronary artery bypass uh, surgery, coronary angioplasty. Somebody actually decided to do a clinical trial to see if surgery actually worked. And the answer is sort of in some cases. And there are some other clinical trials. People have implantable defibrillators and a number of other things going on here. So you look at this and you compare it to the molecular approach that the cancer folks have taken, what do you conclude? Oh, again, this is the Surgeon General's report when we all stop smoking, right? You conclude that the cardiologists understand that you can have better living through plumbing, electricity, traditional drug development, and clinical trials. And that if you make blood vessels bigger in general, it's a pretty good thing. But of course, along the way, mistakes were made. What are some of those mistakes? Viagra was a cardiovascular drug. Remicade which is a, a class, or, or, or the first in, in, or the most prominent, one of a class of drugs that treats autoimmune diseases now, was going to be a life-saving therapy for sepsis in the ICU. It failed in sepsis. It, these types of drugs have been wonderful, wonderful uh, for autoimmune diseases. And then VEGF inhibitors in, in the eyes. VEGF inhibitors were going to stop blood vessels from growing to cancer cells or to tumors and kill the tumors. They've done very little to change cancer mortality. They've been vision saving when used in macular degeneration. And this just is a little history about the VEGF story. Hope in the lab, a special report. A cautious awe greets drugs that eradicate tumors in mice. This is Gina Claude in 1998 about uh, Judah Folkman's ability to shrink tumors in mice with VEGF inhibitors. And uh, other scientists are not so restrained. Judah is going to cure cancer in two years, said Dr. James D. Watson, a Nobel laureate who directs the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. So we've got uh, Dr. Collins out of the way and Dr. Watson out of the way, and we can now move on. <laughs> so the question is, how did we get here? How many people here have heard of Francis Galton? Yeah, this shows we have an educated audience. <laughs> All right, who is Francis Galton, and why does he matter? He's an English polymath. He's actually Darwin's cousin. He developed weather maps, fingerprints, and digital image analysis. 
He was one of the first biometricians, so he made a bunch of measurements in humans about height, weight, intelligence, and so forth. Uh, Uh, he was also one of the founders of modern statistics. His students were Pearson, as in Pearson Correlation Coefficient, and Fisher, as in Fisher Exact Test. Uh, he was also a founder of eugenics. And the arguments that he engaged in in the 1880s and 1890s anticipate many of the nature, nurture, biological determinism versus environmental arguments that we currently are having. Uh, this is the average height of the parent, one parent here, one parent there. This is a correlation coefficient of one. And this shows what the observed is. So this is a very, very early correlation coefficient from uh, uh, 1889, from 1889. You can see a couple of other interesting things here, regression to the mean. So if you have two tall parents, the odds of the offspring being a little shorter are great. And if you have two short parents, the odds of the uh, offspring being a little bit taller are also greater. And he, he felt based on this that about 50, 40, 50 percent of height could be predicted based on parental height. Now, we know that there's continuous variation in height in humans. Uh, this is for women from Inhanes. These are a little bumpy because they're the, the way the categories were set up in the, in the survey and the ranges. But in women, uh, about 99, 98% of women are somewhere between about 146 or 7 uh, uh, centimeters and about 182 or 83. So about 35 or 40 centimeters here for men. The range is shifted about uh, 10 centimeters to the right, and again, about 40 centimeters for the total range. Now, so we have continuous variation in height. In 1900, Mendel was rediscovered, and in his work on recessive and dominant genes, the key finding here is that there were clear patterns of inheritance. So you get 25% with this uh, trait if you do the breeding, versus 75% with this trait, and it was highly predictable if you uh, knew enough about what was going on. So this presents a big problem for the Galtonian folks. Continuous variation versus these clear distributions in, um, in, in the Mendelian uh, worldview. So you get to a point where you then have biometrics versus Mendel. Population show continuous variation. Plant results show clear distributions. How do you reconcile it? Well, this is Fisher, as in Fisher exact test. And this is in the causes of human variability in the Eugenics Review. There actually used to be a journal called the Eugenics Review. And Fisher felt if you knew the height of one parent, that accounted for 25% of the height of the off offspring. If you knew both parents, you could get about 40%. If you knew all the other ancestors, you could get a little over 50%. And the genetic nature of height, he felt, was about, was about somewhere between 95 and 100%. And, you just, the, the, and the problem, and this really harkens to what we hear today, the problem wasn't that Fisher was wrong. The problem was he just didn't have enough data. He just didn't have enough data, not enough big data. So the current GWAS-based estimates suggest about 20% of height is variable, at least explained by genetic variance. The heritability estimates are a little higher than what Galton had at about 40 or 50%. They can be as high as 70 or 80%. And so why this difference? Well, the first thing is there's a big environmental and dietary influence on, on height. This is height in Japan starting in 1870, females and males. And you can see that it's gone up uh, slowly. But then after World War II, it went up uh, very quickly. These are upper class people. This is the general population. So you can see it was a bit better to be rich. You were a little taller. But again, as the economic boom took off, especially after World War II, both populations got larger. The next important thing, so you see about, a, about almost a 15, 20 centimeter change in height over 100 years. Now this is, shows you what happens with these GWAS or these variants. This is uh, the percentage of the population with a variant. About 50% would be out here. This got scrunched. This is the absolute effect size in centimeters. So you notice that there are these many, many common variants, and they only account for 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0.3 centimeters. So less than 1 100th of, the, of that 40 centimeter variation I showed you. So what happens next? And we'll come back to that slide in a minute. Uh, one, a man named uh, Wilhelm Johansson came up with the ideas of genotype and phenotype in 1909 in Copenhagen. T.H. Morgan uh, showed that the hereditary information was on chromosomes. Erwin Schrodinger, how many people here know who Erwin Schrodinger was and Schrodinger's cat? How many people know that, that he, he had a lot of interesting thoughts about biology? He wrote a book in the 1940s. 
He was sitting out the war in Dublin, and he wrote a book called What is Life, based on some public lectures, where he more or less predicted uh, DNA and the way it would function as what he called an aperiodic uh, uh, crystal. We all know about Watson and Crick and DNA. And so we've got this black box definition of a genotype as something that causes a phenotype. That remains, and that's really the basis of these sort of population arguments that are out there. But the definition of what is a gene shifts from a black box to a strand of DNA. But ideas about the genotype-phenotype relationship are unchanged. They're unchanged. So you go from a black box to, to something of a, a bit of a code. Uh, Larry showed this, the central dogma of molecular biology, where you've got DNA to RNA, RNA to protein. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that. And Crick himself said it was more complicated than that. But, but you know, uh, you show a slide like this and, and use a title like central dogma, and at least some people are going to be prone to oversimplify that. And what I like about it is the medieval religious language, the idea of a code. If you break the code, the secret's revealed. This looks a bit like a read-only kind of story. And you eventually get to DNA equals phenotype, and that's where various oversimplifications of this lead. I want to talk a little bit more about this during the rest of the talk. But I also want to show you what Dr. Ehrlich was doing before he moved to Stanford. <laughs> uh, he actually had a prior career as, a, as, a, as one of the early pharmacologists in Germany. And this is his office before he moved to the West Coast a number of years ago. And, and uh, anyways, Ehrlich felt there were going to be magic bullets. So we hear about targeted therapy. Ehrlich thought there would be magic bullets for various diseases. Now, this underpinned a lot of thinking about infectious disease, but he was also thinking about cancer at the time. So if you take Galton, the central dogma, and Ehrlich, and you shake well, you get genotype equals phenotype, and you get to biological orthopedic surgery. Find the broken gene, fix the broken gene, cure the patient. And that's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's not that far off, especially if you think about the enthusiasm for gene therapy. So what happens 2.0? Sequence DNA on an industrial scale. Link these sequences to phenotype. Find the common variants. Do enough and missing heritability and soft inheritance issues are solved. Engineer animal models and then translate rapidly to cures. And while you're at it, you can just ignore epidemiology and physiology. They can just kind of go away. Who needs them? So again, this is the height uh, slide I showed earlier. But you know, I picked height only because it's an easy phenotype. It's easy to measure. All you need is a tape measure. But let's talk about diseases now. Wow. What did I do? It cra well, the reductionists are out to get me, right? <laughs> I showed the slide in Nixon, so I didn't show you my enemies list. Uh, next one, right? 27. There we go. All right, so this is uh, risk alleles, so SNPs associated with cardiovascular risk from genome-wide association studies, and cardiovascular disease event status. This is in over 19,000 women who were part of the nurses' health study. And these are the 18,000 women. This is their gene score down here based on 101 SNPs. Uh, these are the 18,679 women who did not develop cardiovascular disease over 10 years, and these are the 634 who did have an event. No difference. If you take the 12 most predictive SNPs and make a gene score based on that, you see exactly the same thing. How many people here have heard of a receiver operator curve? This is important, especially for people looking for risk alleles. This is what happens when you flip a coin with a clinical test and your ability to predict how good that clinical test is. So this is just random. If you take a 20 gene count score for diabetes, you do a little bit better than random. You do a little bit better than random. If you do a, something called a Framingham score, which is just ask the patients a few questions and, and, and get some information off their medical record, you, do about, you, can, you can come up with about a 75% C statistic, or about 75% of the total areas under that curve. If you add the gene count score to the uh, Framingham score, you don't do any better. You don't do any better. This has subsequently been repeated with 40 genes, 60 genes. And a month ago, a paper in diabetes was 65 genes. So they persist. So phenotypic risk models are probably better than gene scores alone. More genes don't improve things. 
And does it change the advice to the patients? No, you tell people to diet and exercise. So it really doesn't help. And the other thing that's interesting about this is if you tell people what, that they are at high genetic risk, how many people think they change their behavior? They don't. That's been, there's been a number of randomized clinical trials telling people with, that they have high-risk genes for cardiovascular disease or diabetes, and it does not cause them to change their behavior. And it turns out that a simple measure of waist circumference is far more predictive than sequencing for diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, three or four times more predictive. Uh, and you don't need fancy equipment, you need a nurse and a tape measure. <laughs> now, the epidemiologists and physiologists have always been a little suspicious of all this, and I'm going to show you two slides that explain why. These are the Kuna Indians, and this is blood pressure versus culture. And they live off the coast of Panama on an island. And if you look at the Kunas who live on the island, as they get older, greater than 60 here, less than 40 there, there's no rise in blood pressure no rise in blood pressure. And the really old people, and they, they have life expectancy around 75 or 80, so they live a long time. No blood pressure. If they live in a village composed entirely of Kuna Indians in Panama City, so they're, quote, genetically the same, unquote, guess what? Blood pressure rises with age, and by the time you're over 60, about 40 or 50 percent have high blood pressure. So there's a huge cultural and environmental component to all of this stuff. But then people say, well, we don't care about the population studies. What about identical twins? The twin studies really nail it. You're wrong, Joyner. So here are two identical twins. Uh, these are two German brothers. One became a distance runner. The other decided to go to the gym and pump a little iron. Uh, this in individual weighed 20 kilos more than this individual. This individual's heart size was 50% larger than this individual. So behavior matters. And in fact, uh, there are a couple of review articles that have looked for pairs of identical twins who have behaviors that are discordant as opposed to concordant, which most of them are, and found some pretty dramatic things. So of course it's complicated to think about emergent properties. As you see here, here's just a bunch of dots. But if we go far enough, we see uh, this wonderful Roy Lichtenstein uh, painting, and we can ask ourselves, did Roy Lichtenstein know James Black? <laughs> They're certainly contemporaries. And I would argue that we're in a, in, engaged, in, to some extent, in what you might call a biological version of McNamara's fallacy. <laughs> One, we're going to measure whatever can be easily measured. Two, we're going to disregard that which cannot be measured easily. Three, we're going to presume that that which cannot be measured easily is not important. <laughs> Four, we're going to presume that which cannot be measured easily does not exist. And five, we're going to focus strategic, tactical, and management efforts on number one. And I would then say we're going to take all this information and make false models, and we're going to study whatever can be easily studied. So how many people here read the noted scientific journal Slate? <laughs> all right, so Slate had a great article called The Mousetrap. And the argument is, and I asked Matt a little question about this uh, during his talk, about the over-reliance on one species, mice, they're overfed, inactive, and cold. There's limited or no genetic variability. And to me, this is sort of reductionism on four legs. Doesn't want to switch. Yeah, there we go. Just switch. So these are prodroid mice. You can read about how they were engineered. But this is a, a control. This is a prodroid mice. They have extreme premature aging in every organ system imaginable. And you can see this is wild type. This is a prodroid heart showing fibrotic uh, kind of congestive heart failure the way you can sometimes see it in older people. What happens if you put the mice on 45 minutes a day of exercise three times a week? You have them kind of essentially go to the mouse YMCA. The phenotype is almost non-existent, almost non-existent. So are we studying a genotype equals phenotype here, or are we studying inactivity here? You tell me. And so we make these models where genotype does, in fact, equal phenotype, where that doesn't happen in common diseases in humans. We are then able to cure, develop cures in animal models that don't work in multifactorial human phenotypes. Translation fails. Everybody scratches their head because it looked, quote, so promising. The startup goes bankrupt. The investors don't understand. And the big pharma CEO loses their job. And we get involved in this sort of trench warfare. How many people here know the solution for trench warfare? 
more trench warfare, right? <laughs> and Alzheimer's disease is a good example. 240 AD drugs have failed clinical trials between 2002 and 2012. Only one received FDA approval. It doesn't do very much. So their success rate's 0.4%. And there's a continued obsession with making antibodies to amyloid because the amyloid hypothesis explains everything except when it doesn't. So Alzheimer's and failed reductionism. There is, an, again, an obsession with amyloid and tau. Many pieces of data do not fit this picture. They do not fit this picture. The epidemiology says Alzheimer's disease has a huge vascular component. Diabetes is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. In, but we persist in engineering animal models based on amyloid and tau. We treat the animals. Uh, we have early success, then we fail the translation, and we repeat this over and over again as we're involved in sort of uh, Alzheimer's disease trench warfare. So what's needed? A model with modest overproduction of amyloid and tau with concurrent diabetes, hypertension, and lipid abnormalities because that's what the epidemiology says. So the question is, is there a way out? And I would argue there is. One is we need to lose the linear narrative of genotype equals phenotype and trying to stop turning these things into engineering problems and stop the rebranding, which I'll talk about. Maybe less big science. Uh, maybe we need to recognize that public health really does matter while we do, go and, and do uh, try to find solutions to these very unique and unusual diseases. Maybe the right mistakes and luck also matter. Maybe we need diverse animal models, and maybe we need to do, in the words of James Black, uh, we need to find a bioassay. So first, biology is redundant. This is Andy Warhol's double Elvis. And there's two versions of redundant, or two, de two definitions of redundant. One is as an adjective, no longer needed or useful, superfluous. The other is able to be omitted without loss of meaning or function. Biological systems are highly redundant, highly redundant. And that's why reductionism fails in so many of them. So again, let's lose that linear narrative and think we do have an, a non-redundant linear pathway, even though it's easy to sell to politicians, pharma, the general public, patients, venture capitalists, and philanthropy. Uh, we don't have any lawyers up there, so there's really nobody to go after here, that we, that, that, uh, and, and we won't say any mean things about these individuals. And we, now, my question always is, has the Human Genome Project become the human rebranding project? We started off with common disease common variants, small effect size. Then people thought we're going to have common diseases, at least explained in part by rare variants with substantial effect size. And that contrasts to Mendelian diseases in the family-based approach where things, in fact, are very rare. Now, this is currently being rebranded, and instead of looking for risk variants, we're looking for protective variants. So people have decided maybe we'll just flip the question. So again, is this flipping the question and looking for protective variants, is that novel, or is it reality versus the need to sort of feed this big science beast that has grown up around the Human Genome Project? You got sequencing centers, you got hundreds of employees, we got to do something to keep them occupied. Now, we, we had a great presentation yesterday at lunch, a little musical comedy, and I would argue that there's no business like show business and creativity counts. Small groups and networks matter. Small groups and networks matter. This is from a sociology journal. One of the great things about sociology journals is they have 30-page introductions, 30-page discussions, and one graph. Uh, and uh, so this is the pajama game, West Side Story, Gypsy, and Fiddler on the Roof. And these are how the people who came up with these big hits interacted with each other. And these individuals, there might have been an economist, or at least a, a recovering economist, and one of these guys. They developed this small world cue which is a of, of networks and interacting. And they showed that as the, um, it, when you got to sort of a sweet spot of around four or five people, that the probability of a flop went down and the probability of a hit went up. So there have been about 2,500 computer languages that have actually seen the light of day. How many of those computer languages have been developed by more than or, or commonly used computer languages that have been effective have been used, developed by more than um, one or two people or maybe three or four people? The short answer is none. All commonly used computer languages or, or languages that have been successful have either one or a very small team of innovators that made them. So you can't do these things by committee. 
Now, we also need to remember that public health mattered. This is the fall from 800 per 100,000 infectious disease deaths in 1900. This is the flu epidemic of 1918. You can see things came down and it fallen by about three quarters by the time penicillin was discovered. discovered. And it fallen further by the time the Salk vaccine was discovered. There's a huge debate about how much even penicillin or, or antibiotics even contributed to this, or if it was just more wealth, public health, and sanitation that made a difference. Public health still matters. These are risks leading to death in perspective. This is from the National Health Services in the United Kingdom. Things are relatively similar in the U.S., except you get more gun violence uh, here and, and uh, murders. Uh, but high blood pressure, smoking, high cholesterol, obesity, low fruit and vegetables, physical inactivity, alcohol. Uh, we certainly tried to uh, increase our risk last night. And um, uh, so you see that, that a lot of these things really don't have a precision or a personalized approach or large kind of population issues that probably need to be dealt with on a population basis. So I would argue we also have to try to facilitate lux, mistakes, and serendipity based on some of the stories I've told you. These are two Roman philosophers, Seneca the Younger and Vince Lombardi. <laughs> and one of them said luck is when preparation meets opportunity. A great example of that was the idea that viruses, retroviruses cause cancer, was a huge idea in the late 60s and 70s, turned out not to be true. However, the tools developed in studying the retrovirus hypothesis were instrumental in identifying HIV and developing early antiretroviral therapies for HIV. So they were, they were again, right for the wrong reasons. And I also think we need to remember Krogh's principle. August Krogh won the Nobel Prize for, believe it or not, showing that oxygen diffused across the lung. There was a huge argument about whether oxygen was actually actively transported or diffused across the lung. Uh, and he was quoted by Hans Krebs, as in the Krebs cycle, as saying, for many problems, there is an animal on which it can be most conveniently studied. So while people are messing around with mice, bone strength is maintained after eight months of inactivity and hibernating golden mantle ground squirrels. So what comparative models are out there that might provide insight to a human problem like osteoporosis, like muscle uh, loss with aging? like any uh, of the common diseases and perhaps some of the rare diseases that we've uh, heard about. And so again, I think we need to find a bioassay. They have low signal to noise, or, or low signal to noise uh, plagues reductionism, redundancy plagues reductionism, reproducibility issues plague reductionism, bioassays are integrative with high signal to noise, and there are human analogs, and it's possible to do mechanistic studies. And I want to show you a human bioassay here. This is in 2000, uh, people between 50 and 60 in Brazil. These are measures of how easily they can get off the floor. So people who can get off the floor easily have about a 95% 14-year survival. People that really struggle to get off the floor, only about a 60% survival. If you make receiver-operator curves on a simple test like this that you can do in a doctor's office, uh, the receiver-operator curves for these are 0 0.8, 0 0.9 better than anything, you, any biomarker you can draw from somebody's blood, better even than waist circumference. And believe it or not, there was just a report in the Lancet yesterday, you do almost as well with grip strength, almost as well with simple grip strength. So what did James Black say? And again, he was the master of the bioassay. He said, reductionism in biology merely replaces one type of complexity by a different kind of complexity. And he said a lot of things, but here's my favorite one. In the 21st century, we will see the progressive triumph of physiology over molecular biology. And as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So thank you very much. Questions? Ed? Oh, sure, yeah. And, and Niels Bohr had this same problem a long time ago and used the theory of complementarity uh, in biology the way he had applied it to physics. And the reason that I think it's important is that the opposite of reductionism is not epidemiology and physiology. The opposite of reductionism is mysticism. 
Well, that's interesting you mentioned that because at the end of the book by Schrodinger, he's got uh, his take on Hindu religions. And, and he, was, he was kind of a closet Hindu, which is, is interesting to think about. Yeah, you, know, you can get into uh, very semantical arguments like that, but I agree with you that the problem with reductionism is you can get into a measure what, you can get into McNamara's fallacy easily with it. And I think you can then get into these overpromising sort of hype cycles, uh, and, and that's been one of the problems with it. Yeah, several waves. Uh, bacterial physiology yeah. and bacterial genetics have uh, approached this problem uh, a long time ago when you have what we call the necessary conditions and sufficient yeah. conditions. And necessary, for instance, conditions involved in vivo experiments, genetics. But then when you wanted to prove that they were sufficient conditions for something, you would have to go to an in vitro system. And you, to do good science, you really have to. So Agreed. Best science doesn't ignore uh, all of the things that we talked about in epidemiology. Right. It tries to connect. But, it to but what, one of the problems is we have such a siloed educational system that, that it's possible to get a PhD in biology, never studied ecology, never studied anything larger than a cell. And so you, you have people that have no fundamental knowledge of, of things happening in the other swim lanes. Yeah. I, I think criticize. I, th I think reductionism uh, as a belief system is is dangerous. As a tool, it's not. And I would say we're at a fine line where reductionism has gone from being a tool to a belief system. So, uh, so I think it's a collection. Of, I mean, I do reductionist experiments. Of course, yeah. All of that was reductionism. Yeah, right. Trying to. <laughs> I, I, I was just trying to reduce reductions, but again, I think we have to look. Look at it from, from a belief system versus a collection of, you know, another yeah, tool in the golf that's, bag. That's just when yeah. people do equate genotype and phenotype, and in the GWAS studies, they don't realize that the genetic background of different people with the mutations are all different, so that they all have different genetic backgrounds. Environmental backgrounds. But, 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 but if you read, read this... And, and, and you, you know, Richard Lewontin warned about all of this stuff. And he warned that, that things like a lack of knowledge of human migration studies, and he more or less predicted that these GWAS things wouldn't be as clean as, as people thought. Other questions? Right. I comment very much enjoyed your talk, but I wonder if um, maybe fighting reductionism isn't the major battle. I think one of the big battles is fighting uh, the, our love for new toys and new oh, yeah. techniques. Because, you know, the reason everybody's sequencing everything, it's cheap. Right. Now, and, and that's McNamara's fallacy. Study what can easily be studied. Or... Because, you know, in a way, the uh, anti-genetic position, or the, the, the predictability that sequencing the genome would not get you very far has been known for a generation. Right. The discordance of disease in identical twin humans is huge. It's about 12% from cords for rheumatoid arthritis. People that had the same genotype, right. reared together, similar environments, right. similar microbiome, they still only have 12%. Right. And it's true, actually, now in the reductionist system, you criticize the mice, which everybody uses, because if you want a grant, or if you want to get yeah. your idea tested, I mean, we developed anti-TNF therapy in humans, but we couldn't get it tested pharmacologically in a clinical trial till we've done it in mouse. What, one of the things I didn't mention is, is, I think I skipped over the slide, is thermoneutral for a mouse is, is, is 30. Yeah. The mice are cows at about 20. Yeah. We're studying metabolism in animals that are cold, and their, ba their resting metabolic rate at 20 is 250% is of basal. Yeah. So, so there's a collection of issues here. And so I think we have to try to bring it back and rebalance things a, away from big science, 
away from big science initiatives, and I don't think it's helpful when people say that precision or personalized medicine is gonna make us all healthier. I think there are gonna be some big hits. I think they're gonna help some specific diseases. But to, to change these big population curves, it's much more complicated than telling people their genotype or having a biomarker out there. But, you know, this, but, you know the reduction, the discordant twin approach has yep. worked beautifully in, in, uh, in mice. Like we study arthritis and it turns out in identical inbred mice, mm -hmm. reared together, same environment, as far as we can measure, you will probably get one third of the mice that you trigger will develop right. arthritis. So I'd like to make. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm not a molecular biologist, but uh, I've studied some of the work of Dean, yeah, right here. Okay, great. D D Dean Ornish, uh, who's yeah, uh, sure. uh, done a lot of work uh, showing how a coronary artery disease can be reversed. And one of his big precepts, which I think ties in with what you're talking about here, is the idea that lifestyle changes can affect how our genes are expressed. And I think this is a big deal. I don't know what your feelings are. Oh, on that. I mean, comments? all sorts of things. I mean, if you go out and exercise, you change gene expression in your skeletal muscle, sure. Yeah, all sorts of things change gene expression. But I think you have to look at the gene genome as a keyboard, as opposed as a read-only code. And the environment and behavior play that, 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 uh, that uh, keyboard. You get to have one, Larry. So, right here. So actually, right here. Okay, great, yeah, hi. The genetics of the amyloid precursor protein is unequivocal. Uh, if you overexpress the APP gene, which makes yep. more A beta, you get Alzheimer's disease, even if you have only one extra copy. And certain alleles of APP, you can't get it. And in cases, w uh, I mean, there's all kinds of good genetics of that now. So I don't want people to go away thinking that this is something we really don't understand. Well, wait, wait a second. If you, look at out if you look at autopsy samples in older people, amyloid load versus cognition and other things is highly modifiable, and there's a lot more to what's happening to cognition in older people than their amyloid load. Would you agree with that? Yes, there's no question about that there are there are numerous influences on whether or not overexpression of APP uh, it gives you cognitive deficits, but there's no question that it's a, it is required to get and, the and cognitive deficits of APP. And what did I say, what, what did I say in my suggested animal model? We need overexpression of amyloid and, and tau with these other fact, epidemiologic factors, hypertension, diabetes, lipids, and so forth that seem to influence it. So a more holistic model where the mouse model recapitulates what's happening in human epidemiology. I, I agree, but, but a lot of reductionist biology has created a lot of knowledge now about uh, yeah, Alzheimer's sure. disease. Sure, it's it been very effective. But it, it, at everything except curing it. <laughs> so so, so I, I, have, I have a question with, with a, a yes, no answer. Uh, yes, no answer is great. Yeah. So you showed so many things about, and, and Mark asked about, uh, uh, identical twins. I've met a lot of identical twins, and they are, I think they're almost always exactly the same height. Is that wrong or right? I, I think that's generally correct. High, very close. All right, Joe. Yeah, I want to follow up on the amyloid. Uh, uh, we know diseases are complex, and there may be several pathways, uh, many and cancers are differentiated the more we right. get to know. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't really pursue the amyloid avenue, which is now quite available and is showing a lot of promise, um, just because um, go ahead and do the studies and do them well, do, do good science. And a lot of the failures may have been due to poor science, poorly designed studies, and possibly not the right immunotherapies. That's possible, but I do think I've achieved one goal here, is at least raising the blood pressure. <laughs> it, 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 especially, in the people who are, especially in the people who subscribe to the amyloid hypothesis. Thank you very Perfect. much. Thank you, Michael.